Hello again. This is an audio review of Chapter 12, Introduction to Criminology, Feminist Theories of Crime. So um, in the chapter, we're going to briefly review, um, compare and contrast the first, second, and third waves of feminism, identify the key features of various feminist perspectives, look at how traditional theories of crime perceived female offenders, identify some of the problems with that and some of their research methodology issues, look at the main tenets of the liberation thesis, talk about power control theory, um, feminist pathways research, some of the key critiques of feminist criminological theories, and some of the key policies based on feminist theories of crime. Yay. All right, so let's jump right in. Okay, now hopefully you've taken history, right? You've heard of this. This is not the first time you've encountered this information, but it's still important to review. So most scholars contend that feminism has evolved in three major waves, right? So the first wave of feminism starts in the mid 1800s. And this is, you know, often seen as the Declaration of Sentiments um, at the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848. You had approximately 300 women and men who met in Seneca Falls, New York, and they basically established this Declaration of Sentiments that was based on the Declaration of Independence that was really pushing for um, 12 resolutions, which you don't need to like memorize those or anything, but just generally, they were stressing the need for reforms in marriage, divorce, property, and child custody laws. So back in them times, right, you're talking 1848, uh, divorce was not what we consider it today, not even at all, right? Oftentimes, you couldn't get a legal divorce unless you had some proof that you had been abandoned. But let's say instead that your husband is a violent alcoholic. Can you get divorced? No. That's not a grounds for divorce, right? And so it's interesting how even the kind of movements that coalesced around uh, providing more support for uh, the 19th Amendment to the Constitution, which gave women the right to vote, uh, some of the support for that came from the idea that they were really trying to cause prohibition to happen. Ironically, prohibition happens right before women get that vote anyway. But um, some of the stronger, powerful interests, if you look into the history of that time period, that were supporting women's suffrage, um, it wasn't really because they cared about the rights of women. It's because they realized that women would more likely vote like men. And they thought because of the kind of more... Um, kind of social constraints of morality on women, that they were more likely to vote uh, for something like prohibition of alcohol because of the social problems that alcoholism presented at that time. And again, back in those times, you literally could drink like alcohol from a hose at some of these establishments. Like you would pay by like the volume by which you drank out of a beer hose. So anyway, um, <laughs> and even even then, alcohol wasn't regulated the way it is now. Um, it was much stronger. Like people would often, you know, um, have, you know, health complications as a result. Sometimes people even went blind from drinking things that were, you know, very very strong. So anyway, um, <laughs> just to kind of undergird that first wave of feminism, when people say first wave of feminism, right to vote right? They miss some of the nuances, like the fact that a lot of these women that uh, were advocating for women's suffrage actually started from the abolition movement, right? That they basically, they were people that were organizing and fighting against the organization of slavery. And so it's only, you know, in the context of 1848, you're still in that mix of time periods, um, you know, kind of like right in that social shifting time period. So some of these abolitionists realized, hey, if we can advocate for, you know, um, people to, you know, escape slavery, then we can also advocate for women to escape the domination of patriarchy in society. So anyway, um, of course, there were suffragists that were patently racist, of course, right? Actually, some of the uh, major names that we still know today were fine with passing reforms that would have said women could vote um, if they were white women and not immigrant women or women of color. And actually some of the arguments for women to be able to vote were based on racist grounds. Like how dare, you know, uh, black men be able to vote, but not white women, or how dare 
uh, immigrant men who don't even speak English, how come they can vote, but not white women, right? So again, we can't like wash the racism out of that as well. We have to acknowledge like the full history of these things. But anyway, most of the time when you hear about it, you're like, hey, first wave, women's right to vote, right? But it's more, it's much more nuanced than that. It's really interesting to see when you're talking about the reforms in marriage, divorce, property, child custody laws, just how much of that stuff still continued to evolve over time and some of those issues are still somewhat unresolved. So then you get to the second wave. So again, it's not a history class, so we'll just go through it briefly. Second wave is um, you know, typically thought of as the 1960s because you had um, kind of a lot of groups in society that were challenging the established status quo, right? So you had obviously um, the civil rights movement. You also have during the 60s, the development of other movements like, uh, you know, gay liberation movement and others that, you know, um, the anti-war movements that, you know, were really about changing the way that things had always operated in a way that was more equitable for a better future. So, um, you know, that second wave was really taking up the charge of what was not resolved, right? And also, you know, this is a different generation. So they're arguing for, you know, women to be able to be fully liberated, that they need to have access to equal economic opportunities. And this was a big one at the time because in the 1960s, there were still a lot of career fields that were legally restricted from women to have access to. There was a lot of um, issues with higher education not accepting women into certain career pathways or, or certain disciplines. I mean, really, even if you look at the history of, of colleges for women, the first colleges for women were what they called finishing schools, where you'd basically go to learn how to be like a better wife or ha a better household management. So it was for like rich women to be educated, but the education was still within the realm of the household. And again, we don't have all the time to get into all these things, obviously, but a lot of this comes from that separate spheres ideology that was prevalent in the Victorian era that assumed that the world of men is outside the home. So that means politics, that means work, that means all of those social institutions are for men. And that the world inside the home, the family, right, that kind of management, morality, religion, was something that was for women. Right. So separate spheres ideology said men are outside, women are inside. And it just created this kind of dichotomy. But what's interesting about that is our entire capitalist system is built on said dichotomy. So our capitalist system assumes you have a stay at home wife at home to manage all the unpaid labor, domestic labor that goes into life. Right. So this is why it's complicated in the modern era when you have a lot of households are dual income earners and it becomes, well, who's going to be at home, balancing the checkbook, paying the bills, get, filling the house with groceries, cleaning it, uh, doing the laundry and putting it away. Like for myself, I know if I have a day off, I'm doing laundry. But then for some reason, that laundry just gets put on a chair in my room, which I think a lot of us just have that chair. And that becomes the place I then look for my, it's like, so basically I have enough time off to do the laundry, but not enough time off to also put away the laundry, right? So having a stay at home wife for myself in a capitalist kind of society like ours, that would be great. It would be great to have someone at home so that when I come home, there's a meal cooked, there's food in the fridge, there's gas in the car, all that kind of stuff that just is often <laughs> characterized by millennials and, and zillennials as like adulting or a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, it's just really unpaid domestic labor that was often levied onto the backs of women. So anyway, obviously, um, you know, having that kind of support would be great, but it's only given to those that have the material affluence to be able to do that, right? And nowadays in dual income earner families, if you have enough material affluence, you're just paying someone to do those other things, paying someone to, clean your house, to take care of your kids, to mow your lawn, to whatever, right? So anyway, back to back to the uh, kind of political aspect of the 60s. So basically, women to be liberated needed those equal opportunities, right? But it wasn't just in the workplace. It was also obviously within education to give them access to those workplaces. It was also 
equality when it came to sexual freedom. The idea that women should also be able to have sex without procreation, that sex can be for fun and not just for children and not just in the confines of a marriage. If you don't believe in that kind of traditional style of you know, you are, you're a virgin until you get married, you get married within a heterosexual religious grouping, all of that, then, you know, um, you kind of have second wave feminists to think, right? During this time period, such a large shift through the baby boomer generation that you have, you know, the summer of love and this kind of like sexual revolution that really pushes the boundaries of what was accepted at the time. It was pretty radical for the time period. So this also affected the idea of, you know, having more um, political power for women. So there were a lot of different um, kinds of feminists, which we'll get into in a minute. But um, basically, you had kind of the splits here where you had more reformist uh, feminists, you had liberal feminists, um, more revolutionary or radical feminists. Um, and so what's interesting here is people tend to think like feminist is feminist and you're like, no, it's way more complicated than that. There's socialist feminists. There's, you know, all of these different kinds of feminists. And what's interesting is just really what their focus is of how we need to alleviate the issues of patriarchy is basically the shift in focus. So when you say someone is liberal, what that means is that they think change can happen within the system. Right. That's all liberal ever meant. And that's all it still means, even if it's used as like a negative term in society. So liberal feminists were the ones who were really advocating for things like changing the laws to better reflect women's equity. So they wanted, obviously, the Equal Rights Amendment was one of those things. Actually, they tried to pass the Equal Rights Amendment during the first wave of feminism. Did not happen. Um, it got pushed back during the 70s. They were pretty close. Um, couldn't get enough states to ratify it. And then in the, I think it was what, 1980 or 1979, they made the final push. They were one state shy of, of confirming it. So there's still not an equal rights amendment, something that has amended the constitution to say that women are equal, right? That's just not a thing. So anyway, um, <laughs> they weren't able to kind of gain that, that level. So again, um, liberal feminists just believe you change the system by changing the law, you know, such as having the 19th Amendment says women can now vote. That changes the law. That's liberal feminism, right? Versus radical feminism is, hey, these belief systems that think that women are unequal or less than are built into the institutions themselves. And short of radically destroying or transforming those institutions, you're not going to deal with the underlying bias that continues to be present. Right. So and, you know, socialist feminists are looking at more about how women's, you know, economic dependence on men is a big factor under patriarchy. So sometimes it's really just a matter of the specific focus that a lot of these folks have. So anyway, um, that's, you know, the majority of second wave, really, if I can sum it up very briefly, is second wave is about equality. So first wave voting is pretty much it. I mean, it's not, but that's the way that we characterize it. The second wave is uh, equal representation in education, in sports, in workplaces, uh, sexual freedoms. And, and that also, of course, includes, you know, the advent of, in 1960, the birth control pill, um, access to abortion, bodily autonomy, the terms sexual harassment, sexual assault, marital rape. None of those terms existed before the second wave of the feminist movement, meaning that's just not what that was considered, right? There weren't, there, the sexual harassment was just a thing you experienced at work. It wasn't considered a social problem that has to be addressed. Nowadays, you have to go through sexual harassment trainings in schools and in education, right? As a result of some of that liberal feminist reforms. So anyway, you get to the 80s, there's this huge conservative backlash against feminism. They're considered very threatening because they were really upending, you know, generations of, of um, habits and belief systems about women and their place in society as subordinate. And so you get to the Reagan administration, the 80s, this big, you know, Christian right push where feminists become a target for this. And it's really interesting. There's some films and books that kind of posit this argument that this is when we start to get a lot more inform or uh, what's it called? Entertainment television. 
<laughs> that a contemporary backlash against feminism is like reality TV and the focus on celebrities and stardom and just this kind of like vapid, empty, brainless kind of thing that turns women into little objects that just fight each other these little cat fights so if you think of like every real housewives where someone throws a drink in someone else's face or things it's basically a way to take women who have actually during that same time period really advanced in economic position have advanced in social positions in politics have really you know gained a lot more power in society in many levels but it's a nice way to still cut them down to the knees turn them into objects, make them a punchline, um, and really, especially focusing on the physical aspects of women. It really doesn't matter how much a woman achieves because you can just say, well, but look at her, she's ugly, or but she's fat, or doesn't she look old? And it's a really easy way to just diminish women, right? So anyway, um, the third wave, this is really coming about, you know, after, in the late 80s and the early 90s, and it was really more about addressing some of the shortcomings of the second wave of feminism. The problem with the second wave of feminism is it's what we often now call white feminism, meaning it did look at a lot of issues that impacted women across levels of society, but it was mostly just focusing on the privileged aspects of white women within affluent or middle class communities. So it was ignoring the plight of women of color, it was ignoring the plight of immigrant women, it was ignoring the plight of lesbians. It was ignoring, you know, all sorts of these intersections. It ignored people who were gender queer, non-binary, gender fluid, um, people who were trans. It, it really ignored a kind of international perspective of how, you know, women's lives around the world are tied to our kind of like consumption habits in this country. Um, so anyway, really a major theme of third wave is a willingness to accommodate difference, diversity, and change. So for instance, in the 80s, we start to get out of feminist theory this thing called masculinities research, which is basically talking about how gender as a construct harms everyone. Because think about it, if you put people in a really small box and no one feels like they really fully fit in that box, it constrains them. It tells them that they have to act differently than they would want to act, right? We've all been gendered in such a way. At some point in your life, you've heard, be a man, right? Man up. Or you've heard, act like a lady, you know, things of this nature that are supposed to coach us when we get close to the boundaries of breaking out of that box. And instead of expanding the box to say, hey, you know, women can be strong and men can be compassionate. Instead, we say, no, it's one or the other. It's only one or the other, right? So if a woman's acting strong, she's just being masculine instead of just she's being a woman, right? Or if a man is compassionate or he's emotional or he cries that he's being a woman instead of though he's just a man, he's a human being and every human being has the same emotional capacity to love and to hate, to cry and to have joy. But we've put these personality characteristics into these very narrow boxes and it really, really harms all of us. It harms women because women are told that they're less than in society in many ways and restricted from opportunities. Um, and anyone else who's like gender non-conforming or not, doesn't fit that scope of cisgenderedness gets it even worse. Because they're you know, bringing to light those invisible things that we're supposed to not see. But for men, it's also very constraining because it really limits how you're able to express yourself you know, um, who you're able to be in when you're only able to represent masculinity in such narrow ways. Like if you think about, you know, what does it mean to be a man? There's only a few ways in our society we allow men to prove that. And it's not like, okay, I proved it last year. Now I'm a man for the next five years. Like it's something you have to constantly prove, right? And any little thing can slip up and you fall down that hierarchy. So it's really stressful. So a lot of that research coming out of third wave feminism is really also just looking at how gender as a principle also can harm men in a lot of ways. So unlike every men's rights activist thinks, feminists do actually care about men and the ways in which these kind of binaries hurt everyone. So anyway, um, but it did again, look at more perspectives, more diversity, looking at women that had been excluded from those other levels and just looking at the system of gender itself. Okay, let's move on to some of the key terms, super brief style. Sex is the biological variation uh, between people, so such as like reproductive organs or hormones. 
Well, gender is social. It's a social definition, right? What does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a woman? And we know that it's a social definition and that it's socially constructed. So what does that mean? We'll take my gender class. No, I'm just kidding. Do that anyway. But also, it just means that what it means comes from the history of the culture, the time period, and how do we know this? Well, if you look culture to culture, gender means different things. If you look even in our own culture over time, what it means to be a man today is not what it meant 100 years ago. It's not what it meant 50 years ago, right? And so that shows that it changes. And if it changes, it's socially constructed. If it was somehow biologically immutable, then we would see every woman be exactly the same from every culture, from every time in history. And that's just not the case, right? Obviously, there are biological impacts. But what's interesting is how even sex itself as a binary, right? You're either male or you're female is actually a misnomer, meaning some people are born with mixed sex characteristics and end up being what we call intersexed. So, um, and there's various conditions here. Some, some of these are chromosomal, some of these are hormonal. Um, some of these conditions are present at birth. Some of them aren't present until your secondary sex characteristics happen, AKA puberty, right? Is when some of that other stuff emerges. But there's even situations like Kleinfelters or things like that, where sometimes people don't know they even have them. Like I had a friend of mine that had Kleinfelters, where basically she has an XXY chromosomes. So we know that women are typically XX, men are XY. And we think it's the Y chromosome that makes a man a man. But actually, it's really just the not the presence of two X chromosomes. Two X chromosomes is what makes female. So what's interesting is a friend of mine, you know, she is phenotypically female. She never thought it otherwise in any sort of way until she had to, she had some medical issue and she went to the doctor and they did some sort of genetic testing and they found out that she has a Y chromosome. But again, she had no idea. She's never had any reason to think that. So it's interesting how some of these syndromes um, aren't as obvious as we'd think. And what's actually interesting is being born intersex is much more common than we think. Like, it's more common than Down syndrome. And yet we know what Down syndrome is. We've seen people with Down syndrome. We'll talk about Down syndrome, but we don't talk about intersexuality. So it creates this sense that there's only one or the other. And that breaks people, or it just kind of forces people into this binary thinking of this or that. When in reality, it's more complicated than that. Okay, so getting into some of the other terminology, um, chivalry and paternalism are kind of forms of sexism in ways, right? So we'll talk about, uh, you know, uh, paternalist sexism or, um, you know, this kind of form of chivalry that's supposed to be good, but it's really just uh, offensive in kind of a way. So it's interesting. We'll say, oh, chivalry's dead. Well, that's fine, right? <laughs> because here's the deal. Chivalry is all about um, treating people like they're on a pedestal. So in this situation, you know, putting women on a pedestal. Oh, she's, you know, this dainty queen, right? But engaging in a chivalrous relationship really means a bartering system where men hold more power than women. And so they're putting her on the pedestal, right? But it's really because of some sort of exchange, something that they want from her, something that they want her to be. And it's, ugh, it's creepy. So it's funny how when this comes into criminological focus is that sometimes there's this idea of chivalry that affects the way that we can understand crime. So for instance, a man and a woman are arrested together in some sort of, like let's say they're, they're um, at a store, at a retail store, and they're stealing things. The chivalry of this will sometimes say, oh, well, you know, he was the ringleader, right? You were just helping him, right? He used his man brain to do all the planning and you were just his unwitting accomplice, right? So even in the way that sometimes, you know, police investigators or, you know, prosecutors or judges, the way that they can interpret this or juries themselves comes through the sexism that we're all socialized with in the culture that basically tells us that women are less than men, women are less smart, women are more emotional, less logical, all this kind of crap that we're socialized with that doesn't have any basis in reality. 
still affects the way we see reality. So it's actually interesting. We create the difference that we think already exists, right? But anyway, sorry, I'm jumping ahead of myself. Okay, so paternalism is the idea that women need to be protected for their own good. So in a broader social context, paternalism implies independence for men and dependence for women. So for instance, again, I'm going to try not to rant because my God, but here we go. Um, <laughs> when it comes to paternalism, the one that triggers me the most is almost all of these laws that have passed in many states, over 20 states, um, to make sure that women have no access to abortion. They all come from a paternalist framing that says, we're here to protect women's health. We're just here to protect women. Those poor little frail women, they can't make decisions about their own bodies. They're not suited to make those kind of decisions, right? So, you know, it's not for them and their doctor to decide whether it's right for them because of their health consequences, maybe their social or economic consequences, or maybe they already have five kids and the sixth kid isn't gonna work for them. Right? That's not their decision because their little woman brain, that, that's too much. Right? So it's so funny how much paternalism is really embedded into so much of this logic is, oh, we're going to protect women's health. What? So why is it a panel of like white old men <laughs> that don't have vaginas getting to rule as to the kind of literal government control? over reproduction? It's just fascinating. And these are the same folks that purport that they don't want big government. And you're like, what's bigger government than people forcing you to carry a child? <laughs> I mean, seriously. Anyway, sorry, don't get me started. Okay, um, patriarchy just refers to the subordinate role of women and kind of a male dominant society. So society in which women are basically the sidekick, right? Not the, <laughs> not the, um, the leading role, right? That women are less than in a social hierarchy that says w that men are stronger, better, um, more suited to rule society. So patriarchy is, it's very deep because it's a social, it's a legal and a political climate that's based on male dominance and hierarchy. So that's something we'll be talking about throughout. Okay, so let's look at some of the feminist perspectives on gender. So um, the traditional conservative perspective they talked about uh, Daly and Chesley Lind, that um, they maintain from that perspective that the causes of gender inequality are just due to biological differences. So again, um, you know, why are more men in prison? Because they have testosterone, Arr, men, right? Um, and again, this, this logic is also sexist against men. Like, let's just, let's just put a little pin in that right there. Um, the traditional or conservative perspective, again, hint, not a feminist perspective, basically says men are just beasts and they can't control themselves. And that's why they commit more crimes. That's why they rape. That's why they whatever, because they're just animals. And you're like, what? No, we all wear pants. We, <laughs> we live inside. We're, we're beyond that at this point, right? We can be socialized in many, many ways. So obviously you can be socialized not to commit crimes. But it's really interesting how whenever there's an inequality in society, there's an ideology there to justify it. And this is that kind of ideology. They're just saying, hey, you know, it's different that men and women are inherently biological different. So therefore, there's, they should be socially different. They should be legally different. Women shouldn't have as much rights as men. And so the conservative perspective stresses that social behavior is based on biological sex differences. And the conservative perspective doesn't offer any strategies for social change because the idea is, well, that's it, that's it. Biological inevitability means that's all you got, right? Um, okay, so let's move into some of the actual feminist perspectives. Liberal feminism, also called mainstream feminism, is founded on political liberalism, which holds a positive view of human nature, as well as the ideals of liberty, equality, justice, dignity, and individual rights. So a major feature of liberal feminism is that women should have equal rights. And this perspective purports that gender inequality, why is it happening? Well, it's because women have not had opportunities to participate in many aspects of the public sphere. Again, education, employment, political activity we talked about before. So their strategies for social change is just to free women from those oppressive gender roles. 
And there's typically two kinds of liberal feminists, the classical liberal feminists, that they support a limited government, free market. Basically, they're just, uh, they're, they're like basically a classical liberal feminist is kind of like a conservative feminist is a nice way to put it. So basically they, um, versus a liberal welfare feminist that says, okay, maybe the government should actually help. Like if the government has been structured in a patriarchal way that's harmed communities of color, that's harmed uh, other minority groups, that's harmed women, that maybe we should restructure it so that it provides support to the people who have historically been harmed, right? So this could be providing underprivileged people with housing, education, healthcare, and social security. And so they maintain the market should be limited through taxing and, you know, regulation. So, um, again, a major criticism of the liberal feminist perspective is that it primarily focused on the interests of white, middle-class, heterosexual women. Okay, radical feminism evolved from women's liberation movement in the 60s, and the perspective emphasizes the importance of personal feelings, experiences, and relationships. So they argue that gender is a system of male dominance and that women's biology is the main cause of patriarchy. So the cause of gender inequality is based on the needs or desires of men to control women's sexuality and really to control their reproductive potential. So they say the process of gender formation is founded on the power relations between men and women in which boys and men view themselves as superior to and having a right to control girls and women. So radical feminists maintain that sexism is the first most widespread form of human oppression. Um, and there's basically, again, often kind of separated into two groups uh, of radical feminists, the more libertarian and the cultural. So the radical libertarian feminists assert that an exclusively femi feminine gender identity will most often limit a woman's development as a full person. So again, just even if you understand politics, what is a libertarian? They're basically radical, but they're on the right of the political perspective, right? Versus a radical cultural feminist is gonna be much more, it's radical, but kind of on the left end of the political spectrum, right? So it's kind of interesting. They're under the same banner because they're both radical, meaning pushing the boundaries of what's status quo or accepted. But it's a very different turn between one end of the perspective and the other, right? Actually, literally two ends of the perspective. So, um, you know, basically, um, a radical libertarian feminist would encourage women to just be androgynous, while a radical cultural feminist would say that, you know, we should just lift the definition of women, right? That, that we should just make women not a vulnerable category anymore, that they shouldn't be considered, you know, less than. And so some of the um, suggested strategies for social change among radical feminists include overthrowing patriarchal relationships, um, you know, basically finding ways to permit women's sexual autonomy and establishing more women-centered social institutions or women-only organizations. And so one of the criticisms of radical libertarian and radical cultural feminism is that they really have to figure out somehow how to deal with their own schisms when it comes to that kind of ideology, being so far left and so far right afield that it makes it very difficult to have a consensus. Okay, um, Marxist and socialist feminism. So Marxist feminism places gender in the context of production methods. So remember, Marxism, right? His whole thing about those who have and those who don't, the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. Um, so in Marx's view, when you talk about social classes, you have the bourgeoisie or the capitalist class, the owners that they control everything. And then you have the proletariat, which are the workers that are controlled. Their labor is controlled. The money that they make is extracted and given to the capitalist, right? So basically, they're using that same kind of framework to understand gender relations. So in that situation, you know, instead of the bourgeoisie capitalist owning class, you have men. Um, well, particularly white men. And then instead of the proletariat working class, you have women. And so they really say that the causes of gender inequality are due to hierarchical relations of control with the increase of private property and ownership among men. So when those things came about, 
proper priority ownership, those kind of things, and a lot of capitalistic notions, they came about in a time where women had a lot less social rights. So a lot of these things were skewed to benefit men. So um, Marxist feminism focuses essentially on work-related inequalities and also understanding the trivialization of women's work in the home, meaning raising a kid, doing housework, these things are integral, right? If you don't believe me, then, you know, remember me the next time you open the fridge and nothing's in it. Like the kind of stuff we take for granted that are considered women's work, it's all unvalued and underpaid or unpaid completely. And it's tedious. And even the jobs that have arisen from it are poorly paid because it's associated with that kind of work that's been devalued in society because that work is associated with women. So socialist feminism attempts to synthesize radical and Marxist feminism. And they attempt to integrate concepts like male domination and political economic relations. So socialist feminists focus on gender, social class, and racial relations of domination. Because both gender and class relations are deemed primary to understanding the kind of inequality in society. So some of the general themes from socialist feminism is a two-system explanation of women's oppression and interactive system explanations of women's oppression. So they maintain that patriarchy, not capitalism, may be women's ultimate worst enemy. So they'll use terms like capitalist patriarchy or patriarchal capitalism to understand the relationship between those things. Okay, postmodern feminism. Now, it's really difficult to get into postmodernism sometimes just because understanding it can be difficult. Um, I mean, literally teach theory classes. And postmodernism is one of those things most people don't understand. So very briefly, to understand postmodernism, you have to understand briefly what is modernism. Think of modernism as the, like, 20th century, right? This focus on rationality of bureaucracies, the focus on technology is going to save us all, the focus on, um, you know, the kinds of science or the scientific knowledge of that day that was unquestioned, right? And so postmodernism in general is really a challenge or a critique of modernism, right? So for instance, people do this a lot, modernistic ideas when it talks about climate change. We'll talk about this later, but the idea that, you know, um, oh, science will save us all. But in reality, we actually have the technological advancements we need to not die from climate change, but we don't have the social and political will to make it happen, right? So Postmodernists would say, well, is it really that we don't, that it's the science that's the problem? Do we need more studies to prove this to people who won't care anyway? Because their pockets, like these politicians, their pockets are lined with the money from these fossil fuel companies. I mean, literally the fossil fuel companies themselves have been funding fake research for 40 plus years to try to deny the existence of climate change so they could keep operating in a system where they're harming the entire, like the likelihood of life on this planet, right? So anyway, um, postmodernism says we should question everything. We should question how things were done, why they were done, what motivations they had, the context of stuff, and be skeptical. So anyway, okay, getting into that. Postmodernist feminism is a more contemporary intellectual movement that's been modified and adapted by feminist theory. And so the perspective rejects traditional assumptions about truth and reality. The emphasis is more on the plurality, diversity, and multiplicity of women as distinct from men. So the relationship between postmodernists and feminists is uneasy. I mean, it really is with postmodernists and anything. Um, postmodernist feminists reject ideas centered on an absolute world that is male in style, or what, what we call phallocentric. So they reject any attempts to provide a single explanation of what steps women must take to achieve liberation, because truly it's going to matter what woman it is, or the context and conditions in which they live. Okay, and then I added some additional perspectives as well. You got ecofeminism, global, and post-colonial feminism. So ecofeminism developed around the 1980s to examine relationships between environmental issues and women's issues. So ecofeminists perceive domination of women, of minority groups, of animals, and of the earth as essentially problems rather than patriarchy. So 
yes, patriarchy allows for some of this to happen, but it's really this kind of how the ideology has manifested itself in control and dominance throughout those systems. So within ecofeminist perspective, there's a lot of varieties such as, um, again, ecofeminism, radical cultural ecofeminism, spiritual ecofeminism. Okay, let me just, little side note here. Um, we tend to just say, oh, you're a feminist, you're not a feminist. But it's so much more complicated than that as to what you actually believe and what you believe are the problems and what you believe are the solutions, right? Okay, and then global and post-colonial feminism emerged in the mid-70s. It's an international women's movement founded on the commonalities of women's lives, such as low economic status that tends to be the case throughout the world. So the perspective critically explores the impact of development, patriarchal religions, international traffic in women, and the westernization of the third world. So feminists from first world nations are, you know, often as um, they're called, you know, depending on if you're looking at world systems analysis or things like that, core nations. Those are the ones that are heavily industrialized and located primarily, primarily in the Northern Hemisphere. That these nations are essentially interested in issues revolving around sexuality and reproduction. While a lot of feminists that are coming from, you know, periphery or, or semi-periphery countries often called the third world in a disparaging way. These are economically developing nations or dependent nations that are located primarily in the Southern Hemisphere that they're not just concerned with gender issues, but also with political and economic issues as well as their cultures are being developed. So it's really about encompassing a wider birth of how these issues affect, you know, political, social, economic, but really, um, you know, gender hierarchies all around the world. Okay, so let's briefly get into some of these crime stuff. Okay, so, um, you know, there's often been a lot of ideology when it comes to traditional theories of crimes, um, you know, the book goes through a lot of these, the conceptualization of the Madonna whore duality. And I don't mean Madonna like, you know, um, Vogue Madonna. I mean, you know, Madonna like the whole, uh, the religious uh, personification of Madonna. The idea of a woman as a perfect, virtuous mother that's submissive and faithful, right? Or the whore. And this idea that women walk this line between being basically, you know, saint and sinner. Um, and that dichotomy, there's a lot of racialized assumptions as well that go along with that. So the book characterizes like some of the stereotypes about black women, like the negative characterization of black female mo uh, matriarchs. And again, uh, when we read through the new Jim Crow, she's going to break that down a little bit more. So we'll talk about that then. Um, talking about how why these things came about and how it had everything to do with economic conditions for men. But anyway, um, you know, some of these ones they talked about in the book are like the Amazon or Sapphire or Mammy, any of these kind of um, really pervasive stereotypes that still affect the way that, you know, uh, real women are actually understood in our culture. Another pervasive cultural perception is that of femininity as a biological fact that women are gentle, sensitive, nurturing, passive, that they don't have any interest in sex, that they want to be domestic, right? Um, and this is really related to that conceptualization of the cult of true womanhood coming from that same separate spheres ideology I was talking about before. So anyway, we don't have all the time in the world to get into all of that. You want to live your life. So let's just jump into some of these actual theories that were based on this. So you have Lombroso. We've already talked about that guy and how wrong he was about a whole bunch of other stuff. So he emphasized the role of the physiological and psychological determinants of female criminality rather than socializing factors or social structural constraints. So remember, he was the guy that was like, if you look at someone, you can see they're a criminal. So he was like, oh, there's some anomalies that prostitutes or other female offenders have. So prostitutes essentially do not have wrinkles, but are more likely to have moles, be hairy, have large jaws and cheekbones, or anomalous teeth. Also, he said that women who commit homicides have more cranial depressions and more prominent cheekbones. So if you see someone with some good cheekbones, they're a murderer, <laughs> right? So Lombroso's uh, typology for female offenders, it was similar to what he thought about men. Again, that you could just look at a person and say that person's a criminal because look at their face right? 
Uh, w. Y. Thomas argued that there are basic biological differences between males and females, and that humans essentially have four wishes: the desire for new experiences, for security, for response, and for recognition. So he said, if a woman goes into prostitution, she does so to, you know, satisfy a desire for excitement and for response. Right? And you're like, well, actually, you know, it's it's money. Fun fact. It's actually a desperation in an economic situation in which women are not allowed to actually earn a real income. That's why they call it the oldest profession. Right? Prostitution? They literally do. They call it the oldest profession. Um, because it was like really one of the only social values that women have had is their sexuality. So being able to monetize that in some sort of way has kept women you know, uh, economically independent for generations. <laughs> anyway, so um, some of the environmental factors in his work, he said that when a crime and prostitution appears as professions, they're the last and most radical expressions of loss of family and community organization. Okay, so Freud, he perceived women as anatomically inferior. Remember Freud? He's the id ego, super ego guy. I'm sure you've seen pictures of the guy um, all coked up. So Freud, and I, I do mean that, he did a lot of cocaine. He maintained that women are inferior because they're more concerned with personal matters and have very little interest in social issues. So within that perspective, a deviant woman is just a woman who's attempting to be a man. So according to Freud, the best way to treat such a woman is to help her adjust to a sex role, meaning make her be more feminine, then she won't commit crime. Right? Oh my God. This is the same guy that, that came up with this concept of penis envy. He said, if a woman is a lesbian, it's because she's like, where'd my penis go? Where is it? I don't know what happened to my penis. And that she's like, oh my God, my missing penis. I have to dominate another woman so I can feel like my missing penis is, is back. Like he literally thought that. Like he wrote that down. He put that in books. That wasn't a joke. And again, just lots of cocaine. And then Otto Pollock um, wrote this book called The Criminality of Women. And he said it reflects their biological nature in a given setting. And again, this is 1950, <laughs> right? Um, real, real timely stuff here. So he argued that women have been more criminal in nature than what has been generally perceived by many. And he suggests that criminologists should look at the following three questions. Are those crimes in which women seek to participate exclusively or to a considerable extent offenses which are known to be underreported? Are women offenders generally less often detected than men offenders? That's a great one. Or do women, if apprehended, meet with more leniency than do men? So he maintained that the criminality of women is largely masked criminality. It's like basically like we don't expect women to do those things, so we're less likely to notice when they do. Okay, some feminist critiques of previous research studying women in crime. So, research in the social sciences have often ignored women and issues of concern to women, or have created differences between women and men, girls and boys, that aren't actually there, they're trying to find the differences. So in 1977, Carol Smart noted that women have not been entirely ignored in the study of crime and deviance, but she stressed the importance of contextualizing female criminality within a broader framework, within the moral, political, economic, and sexual spheres. So from a critical feminist perspective, Nagar Nafin conducted an extensive review of the literature pertaining to female criminality and said it's essential to understand that by just including women does not necessarily imply the study is using a feminist framework, right? It's, <laughs> it's more of what they call an add and stir approach or sexual approach that does not incorporate key feminist concepts. So an add and stir approach is when you use an existing theory and you just add women. So the theory was made for men and then they just add women to it. Or um, scholars, you know, again, they do that a lot. Or the sex role one is to focus on the social construction of sex roles, you know, or what we currently call gender roles, right? Um, and a lot of the research is not using that kind of approach to understand like, oh, well, how does society explain what's expected for women to do, right? And stuff like that. Um, okay, so then let's see here. Liberation thesis, also called the emancipation hypothesis, attempts to link women's liberation with crime. <laughs> so again, kind of going back to Freud, 
the idea that if a woman is committing crime, she's just being too much of a man, right? So that argument is that, like, let's say, for instance, white collar crime. Women couldn't commit white collar crime when they weren't allowed to work in white collar industries. So there's an increased opportunity for women to commit certain kinds of crime now that they're able to be in the labor force more so. So Rita Simon in the book Women in Crime in 1975 said that only property crime rates among women would increase due to women's liberation movement. That violent crime rates among women has decreased because women's frustration would lessen and so they'd be provided more opportunities in employment and education. Right? So sure, maybe more white collar crime happens, but maybe less violent crime happens. Right? So kind of like uh, chipping away a little bit or challenging some of this women's liberation theory. Um, so Nafine also looked at the assumptions of women's liberation theory and included um, the liberation movement can be linked to an increase in female crime, but it's a function of women becoming more masculine in the culture and that these increases are due to women actively competing with men. But there's various problems with these assumptions, including the assumption about the relationship between enhanced structural opportunities and the increase in women's offending rates. Statistics have revealed that women have not achieved equality in those high paying or managerial professions. So there's been additional criticisms of liberation thesis, including the manipulation of statistics and attempts to support the assumption that gender inequality produces increases in crime rates, which there's just not been any empirical support for. Okay, and then power control theory is John Hagen um, and some of his colleagues, they were incorporating conflict-oriented theory with social control theory, and they're trying to explain gender differences in delinquency rates by looking at family dynamics. So specifically, Hagen argues that youths that are from families that are characterized as patriarchal, meaning the mother has lower status in the family than the father does, that that reveals greater gender differences in the delinquency rates of the youth in that house than compared to youths from more egalitarian homes where parents had the same status or mother was maybe the only parent in the home. So an integral aspect of the relationship between family dynamics, gender, and delinquency rates was social class. And so basically what they're saying is, if a family is more patriarchal, like if your family structure is very rigidly patriarchal and your dad has more power over your mom, then you're more likely to have a situation where you're, you you know, the okay, how do we explain this right? The family dynamic is that the children themselves, their gender is going to matter more, is what that means. So meaning a boy who's raised in a very patriarchal home is more likely to commit those crimes. A girl raised in a very patriarchal home is less likely to commit those crimes. Does that make sense? Because if the power control thesis is saying in a patriarchal home, you know, the man is in charge, the man is in power, then that's going to translate to the actions of a male son in the same way that, you know, the woman having less power, less status, less control is going to equate to her doing less of that crime in society. At least that's the theory. Okay, so um, moving on to some other theorists, um, Cinder Harding provided three characteristics or features that distinguish feminist research. Uh, the first is that it's empirical and the theoretical basis emanate from women's experiences. Why does that matter? Because you can't just take a thing that was made for men and just slap women on it, right? Um, and so these bases or resources, you know, really question as well as challenge traditional understandings of what's been considered human activity as defined by whites, as defined by European middle class men, as that's what normal is. And it's like, no, that's just one kind of person. <laughs> right? The second feature of feminist analysis was the new purpose for women, while traditional analyses have been primarily for men. And then the final characteristic of feminist research is locating the researcher in the same critical plane as the subject matter. What the hell does that mean? Okay, what this means is I do this uh, with my own research studies when I do qualitative research. I use what they call a feminist praxis. And what that means is um, I'm not trying to be patriarchal in the sense of I'm the researcher so I'm above you as the research participant. 
Instead, I like to level that playing field. So for example, what I do is like, let's say I'm doing an interview project and I interview you. What I do is interview you, transcribe it, figure out what I think you're saying and apply theory to it. Then before I publish it or before I submit that draft, I will check with you to say, hey, is that what you meant? Is that what that meant to you? Is that, is that what you were saying? and give you the opportunity to give me feedback, which is usually not how research works. Research is often a very top-down thing. It's the person kind of looking down at the research population. So for me, I don't like to do that. I like to give people their own voice. I mean, their voice is my data. I want to make sure I'm accurately representing them, and I don't have some weird ego complex where I have to be above people. So I like to kind of actually level that playing field and say, hey, why don't you give me feedback on what you think about that? Okay, so um, some other stuff to talk about briefly. Um, Feminist scholars challenge research claims of objectivity, right? (laughs) Because there's a lot of biases that we have and uh, privileges that we don't acknowledge. So objectivity is just, you know, um, what we sometimes call in sociology a value-free approach. You're just objective. You have no interest one way or the other of something. Versus subjectivity is our own personalized experiences and opinions about things. But what's interesting is research cannot ever really truly be objective in that sense because what you research, how you research it, why you are driven into that field itself is often motivated by your subjectivity, by who you are. And it doesn't make sense for all research to be driven by a value-free approach. So for example, I teach a class at Cal State Fullerton called Family Violence. And it would be really weird to be objective about family violence, meaning it'd be weird to be like, oh, child physical abuse. It happens or it doesn't. Who cares? Doesn't affect me. I don't care either way. Like, obviously, you should care, (laughs) right? Obviously, we don't want children to be harmed in our society. So it's not value free. It's, It's not objective. You're coming into it with this idea that child physical abuse is bad because it is, right? And so the idea, though, is that you use rigorous research methods to counter your own bias so that your bias does not impact the results of your findings, right? But at the same time, you can't, you have to acknowledge your subjectivity in what led you to that research. Okay, um, qualitative versus quantitative. Boop, boop, boop. I know which one I like. No, I'm just kidding. Um, So quantitative methods translate people's experiences into predefined categories designated by the researchers. So some argued that there was a need for more qualitative research to fill in the gaps of what we see in the statistics. So quantitative is like statistical analyses. So what's interesting is quantitative is important in setting like patterns, scope, but what it often can't tell us are things like why. So for instance, Um, A quantitative study could tell you how many women have been sexually assaulted. But a qualitative study would tell you what is that like? What, What are the consequences of that? What is it like to experience that kind of status loss? What kind of emotional consequences, social consequences? Um, All sorts of things like that, like how someone feels or experiences a phenomenon. Right. And that's something that can't really be captured at the same depth in quantitative analyses. So it's just a matter of, you know, what kind of scope you're looking at. And some argue that especially for feminist um, understandings, we need to do more qualitative research to fill in the gaps of what we've seen at like the larger scale quantitative studies. Okay, and then feminist criminology evolved primarily from liberal feminists with the realization that and you know objection that gender is essentially ignored and excluded from a lot of criminological theories so early feminist criminology demanded that crime include considerations of gender that had not occurred before and you know that there's these challenges that should be addressed like dory klein says um to you know address for feminist methodologies which includes continuing to search for the scientific basis of theories of men's and women's criminal behavior to re-examine gender and racial or ethnic biases in the social sciences. Ding, 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 ding. That's a big one, right? Like how has our bias affected the way we can actually do the research to find out the truth? And that we should develop new definitions of crime as we do new research to encompass more people and not just men. So um, let's see here. You also have um, daily 
Kathleen Daly and uh, Chesney Lind, who identified the, the five elements that distinguish feminist thought from other forms of social and political thought. So the five are that first, gender is not a natural fact. It is a complex social, historical, and cultural product. So it's related to, but not simply derived from biological sex or reproductive capabilities, right? So your biology does have something to do with you being female, right? But what it means to be a woman, like the idea like, oh, women wear pink or, you know, women like to shop or <laughs> any of these kind of things. Those are all social constructions that have been taught to us by our cultures. Okay, the second one is gender and gender relations order our social life and social institutions in fundamental ways. Um, the third is gender relations are constructs of masculinity and femininity and are not symmetrical. They're based on an organizing principle of men's superiority and social and political economic dominance over women. The fourth one is that systems of knowledge reflect men's views of the natural and social world so that the product of knowledge itself is gendered. And the last, the fifth, is that women should be at the center of intellectual inquiry, not peripherally, not invisible, not as appendages to men, but as also people. So when addressing whether there can be a feminist criminology, Daly and Chesley Lynn maintain that feminist theories and research should be incorporated into criminologist studies of crime. Um, and then, of course, you have... Uh, Burgess Proctor arguing that, you know, for contemporary third wave feminist criminologies, it's essential to build on the foundations that were laid by previous feminist criminologists and to kind of expand those things into what we call an intersectional framework. So, you know, what we call multiracial feminism, where you're looking at factors like race, social class, gender, sexuality, nationality, age, disability, all sorts of other factors. And intersectionality just meaning the ways in which they intersect is actually what ends up dictating the kind of social positions that we have, the kind of uh, social opportunities we have, and the ways in which we're treated in the world and you know how we experience the world. So obviously that's going to help us determine those life experiences that would put people at risk of offending. So in the 1960s, women of color challenged feminism by arguing that the, those perspectives essentially focused only on the experience of white, middle class, or upper class women. So Amanda Burgess Proctor identified key conceptual factors that distinguish multiracial feminism from other feminist perspectives. So first, multiracial feminism claims that gender relations do not exist in a vacuum. Rather, men and women are also characterized by their race, their class, their sexuality, their age, their physical physical ability as well as other social locations of inequality. The second is that multiracial feminism stresses the importance of recognizing the ways in which intersecting systems of power and privilege interact on all social structural levels. And third, multiracial feminism is founded on the concept of relationality. This assumes that groups of people are socially situated in relation to other groups of people based on their differences. So another issue that's been raised by feminist scholars when conducting research on women is that it's essential that one whole avoids placing women as either offenders or victims. That it's often been referred to as blurred boundaries theory of victimization and criminalization. And then lastly, Lisa Marr critiqued both traditional and feminist research with respect to the importance of not overemphasizing or ignoring women's agency. So again, agency is the way in which we make choices. So the more traditional approach often overlooks the social locations of women's marginalization and places too much emphasis on female offenders as active subjects who pursue criminal opportunities, right? Without the context of how they were actually marginalized in society, right? And on the other end of the spectrum, they're more associated with feminist research that women are often denied agency as they're kind of just seen as, you know, living through the consequences of inequities. Okay, some of the policies based on feminist theories of crime, so obviously, you know, influenced by the women's movement or the second wave of the women's movement, our understandings as well as the legal responses to things like rape have undertaken substantial changes. So legislative reforms were enacted in an effort to modify state rape statutes. 
Um, so that's a big one. This in, in includes uh, increasing the reporting of rape and enhancing the prosecution and conviction of rape cases, though we still know it's still only a fraction of a fraction. Um, this is improving the treatment of victims involved with the criminal justice system process, achieving comparable comparability between the legal treatment of rape with other violent offenses, which obviously we still don't have, um, prohibiting a broader range of course of sexual conduct and expanding the ranges of persons protected by the law, right? Meaning not just women, like the FBI definition of rape didn't even include men until the 1990s. Um, and so four major types of legislative reforms were identified, redefinition of offenses, evidentiary reform, statutory offenses, and just the penal structure itself had to be changed to accommodate for, you know, like the actual punishment in jail for a lot of these things. Another example of how feminist criminologists have informed policies is in the area of gender responsive programming. So the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention established a funding opportunity to enhance programs that were specifically targeted to help juvenile girls. And again, why? Because understanding the ways in which, you know, um, gender can be a factor in kind of our social world and our development and the ways in which we then may or may not engage in crime. 